Today, the 2024 presidential campaign, the Republican nominee Donald Trump was hit with a new gag order ahead of his criminal trial in Manhattan next month that bans him from attacking witnesses, prosecutors, court staff, and potential jurors. Because according to the judge, defendant Donald Trump is a threat. Quote, his statements were threatening, inflammatory, denigrating. The uncontested record reflecting the defendant's prior extrajudicial statements establishes a sufficient risk to the administration of justice. And there exists no less restrictive means to prevent such risk, end quote. That was what was going on with the presumptive Republican nominee for president. Things were a little different on the Democratic side. President Biden and, Biden and Vice President Harris spent today talking health care in North Carolina, where Medicaid was expanded last year through the Affordable Care Act. Donald Trump and his MAGA friends are, if nothing then, but persistent. They've tried to repeal it 50 times. Not a joke. 50 times they've tried to repeal it. We stopped them every time. We want to get rid of the Affordable Health Care Act again. But I got news for we're going to stop them again. Today, 100 million Americans can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing conditions, whether you get your insurance through ACA or not. Nearly 25 million low-income adults have gained Medicaid coverage because of ACA, including, as I said, 400,000 right here in North Carolina because of Roy Cooper. Now, four years ago, Joe Biden lost to Donald Trump in North Carolina by just 1.3 percent. And the Biden-Harris campaign is fighting to win the state this time around. North Carolina became the 40th state to expand Medicaid after our next guest, the Democratic governor, Roy Cooper, signed the legislation into law. Now, when you consider the veto-proof Republican supermajorities in North Carolina, you might get the impression that it's a red state. But in 2020, Democrat Roy Cooper actually won 76,000 more votes than Donald Trump did in North Carolina in that election. Governor Cooper, by the way, is term limited. But North Carolina Republicans have nominated maybe the most extreme candidate in the country for governor, the current Republican lieutenant governor, Mark Robinson. Mark Robinson wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Quote, I just want repeal. When it comes to insurance, health care, the federal government can kick rocks, end quote. Mark Robinson has been endorsed by Donald Trump. This is Martin Luther King on steroids, okay? Now, I told that, I told that, I told that to Mark. I said, I think you're better than Martin Luther King. I think you are Martin Luther King times two. Donald Trump actually called Mark Robinson, who has a history of spreading Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, anti-women, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, Martin Luther King on steroids. Isaac Bailey writes in the Charlotte Observer, quote, Robinson and his Republican and neighbors will want us to forget who he really is, but we mustn't forget. In a 2014 Facebook post, Robinson included Hitler's pride in one's own race quote. He claimed he was just doing what every history book in America does because, quote, they all quote him, end quote. Robinson has also said acceptance of gay people will lead to the acceptance of pedophilia. He compared LGBTQ people to maggots during a sermon. He demeaned Muslims and said trans people should be arrested or use the bathroom outdoors. He also helped spread the bigoted birtherism conspiracy theory about Barack Obama. He calls abortion murder, despite the, that being a choice that he and his wife made prior to having two children of their own. Martin Luther King on steroids, indeed. On the issue of reproductive rights, North Carolina has a 12-week abortion ban. It was a policy that was vetoed by Governor Cooper until the Republican-led legislature overrode his veto. Today in North Carolina, Vice President Kamala Harris said this. Across our nation, extremists attack a woman's access to health care and reproductive health care. They have proposed and passed laws that criminalize doctors and punish women. Laws that threaten doctors and nurses with prison time, even for life, simply for providing reproductive care. Laws that even make no exception for rape or incest. 
The result is a health care crisis with real harm. Joining us now is the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper. Governor Cooper, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. You and I talked uh, the day after you made an impassioned speech to the state uh, in front of a group of supporters, but really uh, intended for Republicans in, in your state legislatures to say, don't do this. Don't do this. You're, you are going to do real harm. And the fact is, the populace, the, the population of North Carolina is on your side as it relates to abortion rights. But the Republicans did it anyway. Yeah, this is not who we are as North Carolinians. And the thing about it is that every single Republican voted to override my veto. Every single Democrat voted to sustain it. Even Republicans who had promised that they wouldn't do it. That shows you that we just cannot believe them. Many Republicans are so extreme, they're now trying to moderate a little bit during the campaign, but we cannot believe them because every single one of them voted that way. Look, this is happening all across the country. Women's reproductive freedom is under attack. We saw it in the Supreme Court today. I mean, clearly they're just going after women's reproductive freedom in every way that they can possibly think of. That's why it's so important for us to defeat candidates like Mark Robinson here in North Carolina with a great Democratic nominee, who's our current Attorney General, Josh Stein. And that is why we have to elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You know, they will put Roe v. Wade into federal law if we can get a Congress that uh, would send them a bill. They were here today. There's no better place than North Carolina for them to come today than to, to celebrate health care. I mean, we already have a, a million people on the Affordable Care Act. We've just expanded Medicaid in a bipartisan way. And now we're signing up about a thousand people a day. And these are our child care workers. Mm -hmm. These are people who look after our seniors. And Donald Trump and his the people like him want to take it away. Candidates like him want to take the health care card right out of the hands of people who have just gotten it here in North Carolina. We have to stop them. Which I like, it's hard to understand. I mean, I lost count of the number of times Republicans tried to what, what would reveal and replace uh, uh, Obamacare over the years. In the end, they're still running on that. No one in all those efforts, dozens of efforts, came up with something better, came up with an alternative. I, I think we can all acknowledge everything can be done better, but that's not what Republicans were trying to do. This is kind of like the southern border issue. This is kind of like reproductive rights or IVF in, in Alabama. It's not clear what the goal is other than to be disruptive. Well, they talk about repeal and replace, but there's no replace. There's no replace, yeah. Uh, and every, every single time they talk about getting rid of health care for people. And, and just, just like you say, the southern border, here we had legislation that was the strongest border protection uh, ever. And Republicans, because it didn't fit their political narrative and because Trump told them that he wanted to keep this issue alive for the campaign, they pulled out of this agreement. And, and that is the way they operate. They're going for power and they're not paying attention to the real issues that are facing the people of North Carolina and the people across this country. So we're going to work very hard. I think the road to the presidency runs through North Carolina. And when you look at our statewide candidates, they've nominated people like Mark Robinson, uh, like Dan Bishop for attorney general, who's in Congress now and part of the Bobert Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene cabal. They've nominated uh, uh, someone for superintendent of public schools in North Carolina who believes that teachers ought to have guns in the classroom, who homeschools all of her children and took them to January 6th at the Capitol. I mean, that is the kind of extreme Republican lineup that's in North Carolina and why we believe that we can get a massive turnout in North Carolina for President Biden, for our slate of Democratic candidates, and turn North Carolina blue uh, in 2024. We're working very hard, and we were glad to see the president and vice president today. They've been here quite a bit. We are a targeted state, and we're going to continue to work hard to make sure that this election preserves our democracy, preserves women's reproductive freedom, preserves the opportunity for people to get health care, because I think that's what everyday Americans 
care about right now. We have a piece of news in here. Uh, Marilyn Lands has just uh, won the House district seat uh, in Alabama uh, on, on a platform, and she's a Democrat, on a platform of uh, uh, appealing, uh, repealing Alabama's no exception abortion ban, fully restoring access to IVF and protecting the rights to contraception. So this is the things of what you speak. For those of us who uh, don't understand how North Carolina works, why is it that statewide a guy like you got more votes than Donald Donald Trump did um, in in 2020, but at the same time you've got uh, veto-proof majorities in in the, your, your state houses. What's what's the what's the thing we have to understand that puts Mark Robinson in play? Given that he his the things he stands for stand in stark contrast to what North Carolinians say they want, particularly as it relates to things like abortion rights. Well, the first thing is technologically diabolical partisan gerrymandering. That's how they control a supermajority in the legislature. For four years, we had broken that supermajority, and every single one of my vetoes held. I think when you have a lower-profile race like lieutenant governor, uh, he won in a crowded Republican primary with 30-some percent of the vote, and it was in a presidential year, a, a lieutenant governor's race can, can not get very much attention. People are finding out who Mark Robinson is now, and I believe that North Carolinians do not want to go back to the days of the culture war. Remember, I got elected at a time when we were still walking through the rubble of the bathroom bill yep. battlefield in North Carolina that was wrong uh, in and of itself, but also hurt our state economically. We were able to get that repealed. Now you have someone like Mark Robinson who wants to go back to the culture war. Donald Trump plays into that narrative as well. I think people are tired of it. I think particularly now with this assault on women's reproductive freedom, when you add that to the anti-LGBTQ, when you add that to the jerking away health care from people, and then the positives that, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done for this country, connecting people to high-speed Internet, lowering the cost of drugs and, and, and insulin, yeah. making uh, one of the best investments in infrastructure we have seen in, in a generation. All of that is positive. We're going to be talking about that, but we're going to be taking it to the Republicans as well. I just want to bring you back to that comment you just made about the, the bathroom bill. Um, there, there's a letter that from the Connecticut Democrats who uh, wrote written to officials at the Connecticut Department of Ed, uh, Economic and Community Development to explore opportunities to attract businesses from North Carolina in the event that Mark Robinson is elected uh, uh, you know, the nomination of Mark Robinson as a candidate for governor of North Carolina. We're in a time unemployment is low. Wages are going up. Um, GDP is strong. It's not the most even economy in the world, but it's going in the right direction. It's a bad time for a state, particularly North Carolina, but any state to come up with things that are going to cause businesses who need to keep their employees happy because it's hard to get employees these days. It, it's, a, it's a bad time to be making those kinds of decisions about about abortion and about gay rights and, and things like that. Yeah, why would we make those decisions that would turn people away? I love my buddies in Connecticut, but we are not going to elect Mark Robinson so they can stay away. Governor, it's good to see you as always. Thank you for being with us. I always appreciate it. Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina. All right, coming up today, the same Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade heard oral arguments in a case challenging access to the abortion drug Mifepristone. Up next, Neil Katyal, who's argued dozens of cases before the Supreme Court to discuss what we learned about how the court may decide on this case. Stay with us. Today, the Solicitor General of the United States stood before the United States Supreme Court and explained the damage that would be done to American women if the court limited access to the abortion pill, Mifepristone. Rolling back FDA's changes would unnecessarily restrict access to Mifepristone with no safety justification. Some women could be forced to undergo more invasive surgical abortions. Others might not be able to access the drug at all. And all of this would happen at the request of plaintiffs who have no certain injury of their own. In oral arguments today, the same Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade appeared poised to reject the challenge limiting access to Mifepristone, a drug approved by the FDA 
over 20 years ago that is now used in over 60% of abortions nationwide. The plaintiffs in this case, FDA versus Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, are a group of anti-abortion doctors and organizations. They're challenging policy changes the FDA made in 2016 and 2021, which made the drug easier to obtain through things like telemedicine and in the mail. Now, before those changes, only specialized doctors could prescribe and dispense the drug to patients, and it had to be in person. The pill also used to require multiple doctor visits. Now, today, both liberal and conservative justices expressed skepticism over whether the anti-abortion doctors bringing this lawsuit had sufficient legal standing, given that they suffered no direct harm when changes by the FDA made the abortion pill more easily available. Under federal law, no doctors can be um, forced against their consciences to perform or assist in an abortion, correct? The difficulty here is that, at least to me, these affidavits do read more, like the, conscien the conscience objection is strictly to actually participating in the abortion to end the life of the embryo or fetus. Um, and I don't read either Scott or Francis to say that they ever participated in that. Other justices questioned whether restricting access to the abortion pill for women everywhere, based on the objections of a few, was overly broad. Why can't the court specify that this relief runs to precisely the parties before the court, uh, as opposed to looking to the uh, 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 agency in general and saying, agency, you can't do this anywhere? Do we have to also entertain your argument that no one else in the world can have this drug or no one else in America uh, should have this drug in order to protect your clients? This case seems like a, a prime example of turning what could be a small lawsuit into a nationwide legislative assembly on, 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 a, on, a, on an FDA rule or any other federal government action. Justice Elena Kagan highlighted the risk that this case could open a Pandora's box of more challenges to FDA-approved drugs. You open your brief with a, a somewhat arresting statement. To the government's knowledge, this case marks the first time, and I'm going to say, is it, is it the first time, is it the only time, uh, any court has restricted access to an FDA-approved drug by second-guessing FDA's expert judgment about the conditions required to assure that drug's safe use. Is it still the only time? That is still, to our knowledge, the only time a court has done that. All right, there's a lot to get to here. Joining us is Neil Katyal. He's a former acting U.S. Solicitor General who has argued 50 cases before the Supreme Court. He's a professor at Georgetown Law, an MSNBC legal analyst, and the host of the podcast, Courtside, with Neil Katyal. Neil, uh, thank you for being here. There are a couple of very interesting legal issues here. One is standing. Um, who, why, why is that issue? Let's start with that. W what's the issue around standing? Because it's not, it doesn't speak to anything underlying about Miffy Pristone or a abortion necessarily. It's about whether this case is valid. Yeah, it's good to see you, Ali. And before answering that, I just want to disclose that I am unabashedly against this lawsuit. And indeed, my law partner, Jess Ellsworth, argued the case brilliantly today. And indeed, one great thing about the oral argument today is all the advocates were women, all three of them, uh, Solicitor General Elizabeth Perlager, as well as Aaron Hawley, arguing for the religious doctors. Now, there are two issues in the case. One is this doctrine of standing that you're asking about, and that essentially asks who can come into federal court and file a federal lawsuit challenging something. And the second is the merits. Did the FDA ignore science and safety when it expanded access to mifepristone in the last few years? Much of the argument today, as you highlighted, was about standing. And basically, Aaron Hawley said there are these seven doctors who have conscientious objections, and it might be the case that at some point, uh, one of the doctor's patients will take mifepristone, and it might be that that might cause a side effect, like a headache, and that might cause that person to go to the emergency room. And if that person goes to the emergency room, it might be that that person will be need to be treated. And if that treatment is necessary, it might be that one of these seven doctors is the person treating it. 
That's a ridiculous chain of causation. It doesn't work in any other aspect of the law, and I don't think it worked in the Supreme Court today. Um, justices on both the left and right wings of the court just expressed massive skepticism about this. Um, and so I, I think that's where the case will be decided. To the second part, the issue of judges and science. There was an exchange between uh, Jess Elworth, whom you uh, mentioned, and uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson on this, and it's relevant. So I just want to play for our viewers uh, this this uh, this exchange, which begins because we don't have video of its audio. Begins with uh, Justice Jackson. Do you have concerns about judges parsing medical and scientific studies? Yes, Your Honor. I think we have significant concerns about that. You have a district court that, among other things, relied on one study that was an analysis of anonymous blog posts. You have a, another set of studies that he relied on that were not in the administrative record and would never be because they post-date the FDA decisions here. They have since been retracted for lack of scientific rigor and for misleading presentations of data. Those sorts of errors can infect judicial analyses precisely because judges are not, uh, they are not experts in statistics, they are not experts in, in the methodology used for scientific studies, for clinical trials. Neil, this is not just relevant and, and hugely relevant to this particular case. It's relevant to a lot of cases that are making it to the Supreme Court these days. The idea that agencies of specialists headed by people who are approved by the United States Senate are not to be trusted with the things that fall into their expertise, but that that should be adjudicated either in the courts or determined by Congress. That in itself could lead to a major mess in the way government runs. It would be unprecedented uh, in, the, in the modern, developed world. It, but there are a lot of people who think that should be the case, that there shouldn't be agencies and there shouldn't be experts, and courts and Congress should make these decisions on scientific and technical matters. That's almost all exactly right, Ali. You know, it's the cannot be the case that you can just, as an individual doctor, afraid that one of your patients is going to have a side effect, go and challenge the thing and then go to a judge and say, you know, stop it, this from being sold nationwide or prescribed nationwide. Uh, this case didn't belong in the United States Supreme Court. It was a dead loser every day of every week. It was just because of some rather extreme rulings by uh, some judges that forced this case to go up to the Supreme Court. And as Ms. Ellsworth said, you know, relying on anonymous stuff, blog posts, retracted studies, I mean, this was not the way federal judges, uh, you know, ordinarily behave. And so it was dismaying. And I think the most important worry about a case like this is that if it did go forward, then it's not, if it's Mifepristone today, it could be, you know, who knows what drug tomorrow. Um, you know, that is not the way to run a government. It's not a way to run a society. Now, we didn't cherry pick those quotes that we, we, we showed you at the beginning of this segment. There did seem to be broad skepticism across the political uh, spectrum from, from a number of the justices about both the merits of the case and the, and the process by which it was brought to the Supreme Court and the standing. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I've seen more than 500 cases there at the court. And, in, in, you know, norm, normally it's difficult to tell what the justices are going to do. Sometimes it's pretty easy. Today felt like one of those pretty easy ones. Obviously, anything can happen. But I did feel like today there was a wide consensus on both sides of the court, as well as the middle of the court, that this challenge had to fail, that it just didn't have merit and that the person, people trying to raise it just didn't have a claim to walk into federal court in the first place. So I expect a rather swift decision uh, that may be 8-1 or 9-0 uh, wow. against these challengers to the mifepristone drug. Uh, and, you know, I think that the good upshot is that mifepristone will be safe and available to be used by women the way the FDA has prescribed it uh, to be used. Uh, and this challenge is going nowhere. Neil, good to see you as always. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Neil Katyal, you. coming up, the, for decades, there's been no limit to the number of products that Donald Trump was willing to slap his name on every time in all caps and colored gold, all in order to make a buck. Steaks, vodka, ties, lamps, a fake university that got him sued, a board game, even vitamins and supplements that were supposedly tailored to your individual needs after you sent in this Trump-branded urine test to a lab, a lab to analyze. Seriously.
But Trump's latest grift, it'll surprise those of you who thought nothing can surprise you anymore when it comes to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the grifter in chief, has been known over the years to put his name on anything that might yield him some fast cash and then flop. Trump steaks. Trump vodka. Trump the game. Trump sneakers. And now, Trump Bible. Just one day after comparing his civil fraud libel self to Jesus, Donald Trump, in honor of Holy Week, of course, is hawking Trump endorsed Bibles. A low rent and shameless move for the not so low price of $59.99. The New York Times, citing a person, quote, familiar with the details of the business arrangement, end quote, reported that Donald Trump would receive some form of royalties from the project. Donald Trump first announced his new product on the so called Truth Social that made its stock market debut today under the name Trump Media and Technology Group after merging with a shell company whose largest shareholder, is the firm owned by the Republican billionaire and mega donor Jeffrey Yass. Let's go through that one more time. A GOP billionaire's trading firm, the biggest institutional investor in a shell company, a shell company that merges with Trump's janky social media site, <laughs> potentially delivering a massive financial windfall for Trump, who's in the middle of a massive cash crunch, but who might be the next president of the United States. Things that make you go, hmm. Trump now owns 60 percent of the new Trump media company, or roughly $78 million a share, a stake that is on paper at this hour worth $4.6 billion, on paper being the operative words. Stock prices generally aren't invented out of thin air. They are supposed to bear some relationship to what a company has earned in the past or what it will potentially earn, except this one doesn't, not even close. The valuation of Trump media simply doesn't come anywhere close to matching its actual business performance. An SEC filing shows that Trump's social media site earned about $3.4 million in revenue and lost $49 million in the f first nine months of 2023. Like all Trump grifts, including Trump's new meme stock, there is sure to be an epilogue. Joining me now is somebody who's crunched the numbers on this, my colleague and friend Stephanie Rule, host of the 11th Hour Weeknights on MSNBC. She is also, in her spare time, an NS, uh, NBC News senior business analyst. Can I say something? Yeah. We're used to Ari Melber, you know, quoting famous hip-hop rap yes. artists. Yeah. You just quoted... CNC Music Factory with things that make you go, hmm. Yeah. And I love you for that. Thank and you, you started with Janky. Like, you did both of those things as a gift to me. Yeah. So we could just end the segment it's rare, now. It's yeah. already a win for It's me. rare these days that you and I get to sit and talk about this. But, but I what saw a, a note. treat. What I, a treat. I saw you sent a note out the other day to everybody trying to explain the valuation of this Trump company. So put that aside for one second, because that's interesting uh, in and of itself. Trump's got more money out of this thing than logically it would be worth. But there's something else to it. And we were talking about this Pennsylvania billionaire, Jeff Yass, who is also a very big shareholder in ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, which Donald Trump for a hot second was against and wanted to ban. And then Jeff Yass made his way to Mar-a-Lago, yep. saw Donald Trump, and voila! All Donald, of a sudden, Trump Donald Trump said, Trump's, you know what? I like TikTok. I think I like TikTok. Yes. I think I, so, so, so Jeff Yass backing this is... is, is it's not complicated, right? Here is a mega millionaire, right? One of the richest right. guys in the country, the richest man in Pennsylvania. Now, the biggest backer of the shell company that's merged with Donald Trump's company. So right there, boom, one could say he's trying to curry a favor. But Jeff Yass is not a traditional investor. Right. The hedge fund that he's co-founded, Susquehanna, is what's known as an options trading firm. Right. It's a derivatives house. So when lots of us look at this company and the fundamentals and say, this Doesn't makes make sense. no sense. Right. right. This is why you didn't see traditional lenders, traditional insurance companies say, yeah, we're going to lend Donald Trump money against the stock. Because when you look at the company, all it does is lose money. It has a tiny amount of, of, of advertising revenue. Right. It has absolutely no features, right? Any social media company that has gone public has some sort of innovation. This company does not. Right. But the way Yass invests, yes, he's investing. He, he, he's going to back this company, which is going to certainly help Donald Trump, hoping that Donald Trump will win. But even if he doesn't, I am sure this guy has this position hedged in six different ways that it's not nearly as big of a loss as one would think. Right. So what do you call it? 
It's, it's, I mean, the, if you're Donald Trump, the SEC is looking at everything you do. So it's likely not illegal at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Yass is just the CEO of a company that's an investor in a shell firm that merged with this. It does feel like influence peddling. Absolutely. And one could say that buying up shares of this stock is basically like unregulated ways to be a huge donor to Donald Trump. But guess what? You might not like it. It might feel yucky. It might feel like a grift. But at the end of the day, he may be the luckiest guy threading this needle and it might work out for him. Now, Donald Trump can't sell his shares in this company right now. You know, at one point today, they were worth six billion dollars on paper. At the end of the day, they were worth four and a half billion. Still huge numbers. He's not in a position to sell yet. He has right. a six month lockup unless he gets a waiver, which he might. But remember, when he goes to sell, this stock might tend. Right, he's the biggest shareholder. And Correct. So, so all of a sudden, when you try and unload that many shares, it suppresses the market. But lots of people who are buying up the shares are also Donald Trump super fans. Right. And we've got the meme stock traders again. Remember, since 2019, you had all these day traders in the market saying, right. we're going to run a stock up. We're going to take it to the moon. So you've got those elements all coming together. And now Donald Trump, like peak 2024, has become a meme stock. Are you, I mean, you talk to people all the time about this. Is anybody, are any sort of sensible fundamental investors like our viewers should be, the people who say, hey, a stock's should be worth about this. Are there any of these kind of parties involved in the stock? Not really, but you definitely have options traders who are saying, I'm going to bet on the fact that Trump it, might win. Gonna I'm going to yep. see where things are going to be six months from, excuse me, six weeks from now. Um, no, but you do have a, a group of those feverish day traders that, you know, right, we're living in a time when IPOs are hot again. Bitcoin is doing well again. And since 2019, basically, when commissions to trade stocks went to almost zero with the Robinhood yep. app, and others, right? When the barrier of entry lowered so much, yep. so lots of everyday people could get involved and trade the markets, lots of those people are now investing in this. Is it going to work out for them? Unclear, but we say this every day, like, you know, buyer beware. Marketing Just like Trump Bibles, right? We could right. laugh about it and say, this is a grift, this is absurd, this is hypocritical. But guess what? These are free I'm markets. Buying. If people want to buy the Trump Bible, have at or it. Steaks or vodka or whatever the case is. I'm not sure about sending a urine sample to... Trump group to get checked. But, That's your you know, own whatever. personal. That's my yeah. own personal stuff. Some people might like to send that to him for their own reasons. Nice to see you, buddy. Always great. You're gonna have a show, a uh, good show tonight. We'll see. I hope. <laughs> Stephanie Rule, my old friend. Uh, thank you, my friend. Did you call me old? No, uh, old friend. A friend who's been you my friend for a long time. Stephanie Rule, my friend of great longevity. You're older than I am. Uh, I, I, we don't, whatever. Oh, you think? You're <laughs> <laughs> All right, serious show here. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about the diplomatic rift between Washington and Tel Aviv that was on full display today at the Pentagon, what it could mean for the future of U.S.-Israeli relations and the ongoing war in Gaza. That's next. Today, the United States Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with his Israeli counterpart, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, in Washington, where Austin urged Gallant to avoid a ground offensive in Rafah. But not in attendance at that meeting today was the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu's top advisor, Ron Dermer. Netanyahu abruptly pulled his advisor yesterday after the United States, for the first time, did not block a United Nations Security Council resolution demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. Instead, Netanyahu's advisor appeared on Fox News this morning, where he said Israel is absolutely planning to go into Rafah, where more than 1.5 million people have, have taken refuge. We cannot afford to not go into Rafah and finish the job, because then what they'll do is October 7th again and again and again. So there, there's no chance that Israel is not going to go and finish the job in Rafah. Once we finish Rafah, the heavy phase of this war will be behind us and the terror army of Hamas will be dismantled. And then we can start talking about what happens the day after. Once we finish Rafah, the Biden administration is literally telling Netanyahu's government, do not do this. Here's Vice President Kamala Harris on Sunday. We've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafa with any type of military operation. A mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. 
The administration says it's ruling out nothing in terms of consequences, but what is it ruling in? The day the vice president made those comments, I read this extraordinary 13-post uh, thread from Norm Ornstein. You all know Norm well as a congressional historian and an expert on American government. We rely on his analysis regularly. But his thread on U.S.-Israeli relations begins like this. I am fiercely pro-Israel, including its right to defend itself against terrorists. But I can also draw a distinction when leaders do bad things, including sanctioning armed vigilantes in the West Bank and pushing to annex more territory for settlements in a rebuke to Biden. The millions of Israelis have demonstrated against Netanyahu's government, even during this war, are not anti-Israel propagandists. What Bibi, Finance Minister Smotrich, National Security Minister Ben Gavir are doing will divide and alienate many of the remaining supporters of the country, further isolating Israel. This direct and overt insult directed at Biden with the expectation that it will be met with inaction is reckless, immoral, and dangerous. A stronger signal needs to be sent to the leaders of this government, including articulating a plan for the day after the war. Norm's uh, thread ends like this. As President Biden has said, it is essential to do whatever can be done to minimize both civilian casualties and collateral damage, including providing and distributing food and water, and to have a plan ready to govern after the war. That includes working assiduously to find a governing force among Palestinians, who are neither corrupt nor ineffective and who genuinely commit to peaceful coexistence. Pushing Bibi and his government to do these things is correct and necessary, making clear that there will be consequences if he not only fails to heed this advice from his closest and most significant ally, but acts belligerently to reject it. Joining us now is Norm Ornstein, a congressional historian. He's an emeritus scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Norm, we talked to you about a lot of things, normally not, not this particular talk, topic, but it's no surprise. You're, you analyze things for a living, so you are analyzing this situation. And the analysis that you're providing is that this has to go a different way right now. This, this, this uh, butting heads between Joe Biden and, and, uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu needs to have a different outcome. And, you know, I can almost call it tough love, Ali. Uh, what Israel is doing with this government and what really set me off was uh, this decision to expand settlements immediately after we had seen the comments by uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and uh, President Biden uh, calling on uh, Bibi Netanyahu and the Israeli government to do just what we what you were uh, quoting, to make sure that you... Uh, take care of civilians with food and water, that you minimize civilian casualties, and that you have a plan for the day after. And that plan can't wait until after the war ends. And when Netanyahu did this, and now, as you said, this gesture of uh, refusing to send uh, Ron Dermer and the other advisor to Washington, it's a direct challenge to President Biden done clearly in part for uh, Bibi Netanyahu's domestic considerations, but it's going to hurt Israel. And it, a lot of Israelis recognize this. And you don't have to suspend criticism of a government during the war, as so many millions of Israelis have done, to try and move them back to a different and better path. And they're I, not there now. Let's talk about domestic considerations. And, and that's right. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is largely using this as a campaign tactic for a campaign that's not on, uh, because he has sort of said, I'm the one who can stand between Joe Biden, whose embrace of Israel on October 7th and October 8th and October 9th and October 10th was remarkable. Um, the, the, when I was there, when the war started, people... You know, everybody was saying, saying thank you to Joe Biden. Joe Biden has stood by Israel. And he's not saying he won't stand by Israel. He's literally saying, Benjamin Netanyahu, you need to take a different approach to this thing uh, to prevent more civilian deaths. And I, I think that Netanyahu has made a calculation that he can do almost anything he wants and America will just stand by uh, because we have such a strong relationship. And I don't think that's going to work anymore. And frankly, I don't think it should work anymore. There have to be consequences for some of these things. And let me reiterate, this is not just about Gaza. It's about some of these broader considerations. Ben Gavir has armed 100,000 settlers, a lot of them radicals, many of them vigilantes, with assault weapons, probably many of them coming illegally from the United States, 
which is going to make matters worse for Palestinians in the West Bank, but also potentially for a civil war within Israel. These things, a, a, a friend has to say, you can't go on this way, and you can't go on without thinking through how you're going to have a responsible Palestinian authority. And let's face it, it has to include a pathway to a Palestinian state, not next week, not next month, not next year, but that has to be on the table. And those expansions of settlements are designed to take it off the table. That should not be acceptable. Norm, you, you followed politics here in America. Let's do the domestic uh, political situation. This is affecting Joe Biden to some degree. That speech by Chuck Schumer wouldn't have been a renegade act, right? The, at, at, at least the White House would have known he was doing it, and at best they may have, uh, you know, had some coordination in it. That was quite something from Chuck Schumer. I mean, he is the highest-ranking uh, elected Jewish person in this country, and proudly so, and proudly an ally uh, of, of Israel's. And again, it was not about Israel. It was not about breaking with Israel. It was about about this Israeli right-wing government and the damage that it can continue to do. I will say, Ali, that actually, ironically, we may see this coming to the kind of conclusion that Chuck Schumer was talking about, uh, a, an early election, over a completely different issue. To keep his right-wing coalition together, Bibi Netanyahu has had to make all kinds of concessions to the ultra-religious Haredi including trying to keep them all from having to serve in the military while you're in the middle of a war. And his coalition partners, who are not a part of that uh, particular community, are not real happy. So that may be good news. I just want to make one comment on the domestic situation. It yep. certainly hurt Joe Biden. He's done it because of what he believes is in America's national interest. We've got a bigger problem in this country now with the divisions that are being caused. I recommend to everybody a remarkable piece in The Atlantic out today by Theo Baker, who is a great journalist and also a sophomore at Stanford University, pointing out that it's not just the East Coast universities that are seeing these divisions occur. The kind of really vile acts and uh, statements made by people across the board on these issues we don't need to see this in America, and it's not just about presidential politics. It's about uh, the entire nation and a civil discourse. Norm, thank you uh, for always uh, being a, a sharp intellectual analysis uh, analyst on this. We always appreciate uh, you joining us. Norm Ornstein, we'll be right back. That's tonight's The Last Word. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.